سلام علیکم و رحمت الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلی العظیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و نبینا ابی القاسم المصطفى محمد و علی آله الطیبین الطاهرین لا سیما بقیت الله فی الارضین اجل الله تعالى فرجه الشریف و جعلنا من اعوانه و انصاره I am very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity to meet my dear brothers and sisters here and to discuss about something which I believe is vital and crucial for us And in a sense, it is related to the love for Ahlul Bayt and to our commitment to follow the path of Ahlul Bayt And in these days and nights that belong to the Lady Fatima السلام, it is very important to, inshallah, share our ideas and thoughts about this topic and inshallah there would be enough of time for your comments, questions and inshallah maybe some practical proposals about how to implement this idea in the last I can say maybe 16, 17 months I have given many lectures on this topic because when this topic came to my mind summer 2008 then I felt responsible to mention this to write about this and if I travel somewhere and I have chance to talk to someone even in the car or in a meeting I take the opportunity to talk about this topic so if I have one talk it's about this if I have two so one of them is this so if you google you will find that I have given this topic in different communities in UK in Canada in Tanzania in many different countries so I share with you this idea and those who are more interested, uh, they can read the paper, Collective Nature of Velaya, which was published in the Message of Thakali. Sometimes what we do is that after the talk, we have had group discussions. So people were divided into smaller groups and thought about the topic and about the way we can practice this and then we had some final remarks. But here it seems that the format is that I give the talk, then we would have the question and answer. We believe that we must not only love Ahlul Bayt salam, but also we must follow them. This is one important difference between us and our Sunni brothers and sisters. They have love for Ahlul Bayt You hardly find someone in this age who would hate Ahlul Bayt and call himself Muslim. Alhamdulillah, this age everyone loves Ahlul Bayt. But the difference is that whether this love generates commitment to follow them or not. They love Ahlul Bayt, they respect Ahlul Bayt, but then when they want to understand what should they do and how should they understand Islam, they refer to other people. And the maximum you see is that they say, okay, Ahlul Bayt are equal to others. 
And this is the maximum. Even this, unfortunately, is not seen. Because if you read, for example, major collections of hadith of our brothers and sisters, you see hardly hadith from Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam. So even equal treatment is not given to Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam. But the maximum is that they say, okay, all the companions of the Prophet are hujja, all are like stars, as they quote the Prophet. Ashabi kan nujum, my companions are stars. Whichever you want to follow, it's fine. Then you would be guided. But we believe that this love for Ahlul Bayt, which is introduced as a kind of payment for the old efforts that the Prophet made in delivering the message of Allah cannot be just a love that someone has as a feeling in his heart without affecting his life. This love must be a love that changes the life of someone. And the best thing is the Quran. The Quran says, and we have this also mentioned in Du'ai Nudbe, that this love that I want from you for Ahlul Bayt is for those who want to have a path towards the Lord. Illa man an ila rabbihi sabila. So this love must show us sabil, must show us the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, if you want to know how to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this love must become like light that guide you towards the will and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, this is something that we all accept. So, so far, there is no ambiguity. And this is why we are all followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam. So not only we love them, but we also follow them. But something that I think is unfortunately missing in our communities, I mean the Shiite communities, is that we think to follow Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam is something personal, something individual. Every person should try to love Ahlul Bayt salam and follow them and work for them, try to promote their causes. And then we think that if we do this, it's done. We think that this is something which every person, independent from others, can do. And this is not the case. So what I am trying to explain in the next, inshallah, one hour or one and a half hour, is to make it clear that this is not what Ahlul Bayt salam wanted from us. Ahlul Bayt salam wanted us to act as members of a community, not as a scattered and separated individuals. We are to be really like one body. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Mathalul mu'mineen fi tabaddihim wa tarahumhim wa ta'atufihim ka mathal jasad. The example of the believers in their affection, in their sympathy, in their passion or compassion is like one body. If any part of body is in pain, it would affect the whole body. And as the Prophet said, 
if some part has, for example, a problem, then the rest of body would support him and show sympathy by having a fever, by not sleeping in the night. It's impossible that one part of body has problem and the rest are enjoying themselves. And even they don't know what is happening to that part of body. We unfortunately repeat these hadith, this hadith and hadith like this. We read the Quran and repeat the recitation of the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةِ The brothers and sisters of faith that Quran expects us to be. But unfortunately, we don't take these things seriously. We think that this is maybe exaggeration or maybe, you know, just a kind of prescription which is not necessary. But inshallah, why I will try to do is to make it clear that indeed this is the whole test for our faith. If you want to see how faithful you are, this is the test. You may have heard the story of one of the Shia from the city of Kufa called Burayd al-Ajli. He went to the fifth Imam, Imam Baqir alayhi salam, and told him, O oh, Imam, Alhamdulillah, you have lots of followers in Kufa. Why don't you uprise against Umavids? And you know, Umavids were very, you know, wicked and very corrupt people. Not only what they did in Karbala, but also the attack to Medina. Lots of things that you know about Umavids. So for sure, the only thing that could stop Imam not uprising against them could be having lack of support. So this man told Imam, you have many supporters. Why don't you uprise? Okay. Now imagine you are in the position of Imam. As a leader who wants to examine the readiness of his followers. So how do you examine the readiness? Imam didn't ask how many. So the quantity was not the main concern. Of course, quantity is important. But it was not the primary concern of Imam. Imam didn't ask the, how, for example, educated they are, how affluent and rich they are. No. Imam didn't ask how much prayer they say. How much homes they pay, how much alms they give. No. What was the question of Imam? Imam said, Ayyadha'u ahadukum yadahu fi kisa akhi fayakhudhu hajata. Is any of you, when he is in need and his brother is not there, is he able to put his hand? in the pocket of his brother, for example, and take what he needs and solve his problem, and then perhaps later tell him that I was in need of money, I took money from your pocket. Have you got so much friendship and brotherhood? He said, no. Then Imam said, فَهُمْ بِدْدِمَائِهِمْ أَبْخَلْ if this is the case with their money, so with their blood, they would be more miserly. But look, Imam didn't ask him, are they giving money to me? So if he said no, then Imam said, okay, they don't give their blood for me. This was not the test. The test was, how close and intimate is their own relationship? In other words, if you want to understand how 
as strong is your love for Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam you must test it by seeing how strong is your love for their followers. There are many people who are ready to die for Ahlul Bayt, I'm sure. Of course, I'm not saying everyone, but there are many people. Because when the test comes, the situation is different. It is said that one of our great ulama, Mullah Muhsin Faiz Kashani, was wondering why Imam Hussein alayhi salam told his companions that I don't know any companions better than you. He was wondering why Imam said this. And he was thinking, every Shia, when he is put in that position, would do the same. And then he had a dream that it is the battle and like the day of Ashura when Imam wanted to say his prayer. You know, two people stood in front of Imam to act as shelter. So Mullah Muhsan Fais saw himself in the dream being in between Imam and the enemies. So he was standing there. But when the first arrow came, he bent. And the arrow hit Imam. He was very sorry and said, what was this that I did? Then he stood again. The second arrow came. He did the same. Because sometimes this is not in your own control. You have to be really prepared and brave. Otherwise, unconsciously, you escape. So then, after that dream, he realized that this is why Imam Hussein alayhi salam said, that I don't know of any companions better than you. Especially if you know, and this is something special in Karbala, that those companions of Imam Hussein knew that for sure they couldn't save the life of Hussein. But they knew that in the end Hussein would be killed. It's because sometimes you have the hope that maybe if I give my life, I can save my Imam. But they knew that they are not going to change the end of the story. But still, they didn't leave Imam alone. This is very special. In any case, there are many people, I'm not saying everyone, but I'm sure there are many people who, if they are put in a situation that they see they have to offer their life to Imam, they would do. But... How many people are ready to die for their own brothers and sisters, for the followers of Ahlul Bayt salam? This is the test. In Ziyarat Ashura, we say, Ya Abu Abdullah, Enni Salmon Leman Salamakum, Wa Harbun Leman Harabakum. The same thing. I am at peace with whoever is at peace with you. This is the test. This is the challenge. If you say, I am at peace with you. This is easy. Sometimes we have this. But this is not difficult. But if you say, I am at peace with whoever is at peace with you. And at war with whoever is at war with you. What does it mean? It means that I have so much purified my intentions, my feelings, my heart, that my friendship and enmity is no, ma no longer personal. My friendship and enmity are based on the relation that people have with you. With the truth, with the good. It's not that because someone is kind to me, I love him, even if he is an enemy of you. And if someone is not kind to me, doesn't respect me, I want to kill him, even if he is a good person, but not good with me. If you look carefully, you find that in many communities we have this problem. Communities 
are normally divided into two, into three, into ten different groups. Some are very close to each other, but unfortunately against the rest of the community. But if you look deeply and carefully, you don't find necessarily this is because they have different ideas or different you know, understandings about what should we do for community. At the end, you find most of these divisions are because some people have some emotional attachment to each other. For example, they come from the same town, or they are, you know, members of the same family, or they have been in the same school. So somehow they feel closer to each other, and they want to keep this by separating the rest from themselves. But... says that as a follower you have to look at your masters. If someone is loving them and following them you have no right to be against such person, to hate such person, to dislike such person. Okay. This Selmun Leman Salamakum is repeated twice. Have you noticed? In Ziyarat Ashura, this is repeated twice. This shows it is important. But in the second time, there is an addition. What is the addition in the second time? Vavaliyun Leman Walakum. Vadubun Leman Adakum. I am at peace with whoever is at peace with you. But I am vali of whoever has your velaya. So velaya is not only between me and Imam. Many people think that velaya is between me and Imam. I am his vali. And he is also my vali. You know, velaya is mutual. Did you know that? Velaya between us, for example, and Allah is mutual. The Quran says, Ennama Allah is your wali. But also the Quran says, Enna awliya Allah. La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. So Allah is the wali for believers. Allahu waliyu alladhina amanu. But also the believers are wali for Allah. Okay? So, Velaya is a mutual relation between master and the follower. Velaya is something that connects them, links them, and ties them together. Although there are different positions, one is to be followed, one is to follow. But still, the relation is between them. And inshallah, later on I will explain what is this relation. The same is about Ahlul Bayt. Sometimes we say, Ana waliyun lakum, or Ana maulan lakum, and sometimes we say, You are my wali, you are my maula. The same thing is here. But what we have here in Ziyarat Ashura and in other places is that this is extended to all members of the community. Not only Imam and me have a relation of Velaya, but also this is extended to all members of the community. Waliyun Leman Walakum. And this is in the Quran. Al Mu'manun wal Mu'manat Ba'vuhum Awliya'u Ba'v. Believing men and women are Wali for each other. Okay? So, Every person here is my wali, and I am his wali. A mu'min who lives in an island in Pacific Ocean, he is my wali. And this is serious, it's not joke, this is not exaggeration, this is a serious issue. It has lots of practical implications. وَلِيٌّ لَمَنْ وَعَدُوٌّ لَمَنْ 
our dog. Okay. Now, what should I do with these awliya that I have? We say in Ziyarat Ashura, Ya Abu Abdullah, Inni ataqarrabu ila Allah. You want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want a path towards Allah. What is the path? This is mentioned. Ataqarrabu ila Allah. Wa ila rasulihi. Wa ila amir al-mu'mineen. Wa ila fatimata. Wa ila al-hasani. Wa ilayka. Bimubalatikum. Wa bilbaraat min a'dakum. I want to get closer to you. First of all, of course, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then to the Prophet, to Imam Ali, to the Lady Fatima, to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, by two things. By having your velaya, and by distancing myself from your enemies. Okay? But, again in Ziyarat Ashura, this is repeated. With an addition. أَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيْكُمْ In the previous one was إِلَى رَسُولِهِ وَإِلَى أَمِيرِ الْمُمُنِينَ وَإِلَى فَاطِمَةِ وَإِلَى الْحَسَنِ وَإِلَيْكَ Now it is said ثُمَّ إِلَيْكُمْ Which means the same. I get close to you. I seek a proximity to you by بِمُوَالَاتِكُمْ وَمُوَالَاتِ وَلِيَّكُمْ so this is repeated, but with some addition here in between. Your velaya and velaya of whoever has your velaya. So if you want to get close to Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam, you have to strengthen your relationship with your brothers and sisters. Muvalate waliyakum. Muvalate kum is clear. Your velaya includes all ahlul bayt. But also muvalate waliyakum. If there is someone who is very respected, for example, you know, if there is a very pious mu'min, a very respected man, and you want to get closer to him. You want to please him. What would you do? You try to do some services for him. Okay? But also, you try to serve whoever is related to him. Maybe he himself doesn't need anything from me. But then I see his son or his daughter, for example, is in need of some help. So I help that daughter or son of him to make that person happy. Yes? And if God forbids, if I annoy or fight his son or his daughter or, you know, wife or mother or father, then he gets angry with me. I cannot say, I have always been respectful to you. I have always loved you. He says, if you love me, why you have done this to my mother or to my children? Yeah? The same is about Ahlul Bayt. Not only you have to love them, you have to love Whoever is connected to them, whoever is their wali. Okay. Then in Ziyarat Ashura we say, فَأَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الَّذِي أَكْرَمَنِي بِمَعْرِفَتِكُمْ وَمَعْرِفَةِ أَوْلِيَاءِكُمْ وَرَزَقَنِ الْبَرَاءَةَ مِنْ أَعْدَاءِكُمْ I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has honored me by knowing you and knowing your awliya. So this is an honor from Allah if you know the members 
of this community of faith. If you know the followers of Ahlul Bayt, I ask Allah who has honored me by knowing you and knowing your followers, وَرَزَقَنَ الْبَرَاءَ And by distancing and disassociating myself from your enemies, I ask such an Allah, such an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me the following. Please listen very carefully. If you say, I ask Allah who is merciful to give me something, what do you expect that request should be? If I say, I ask Allah who is very merciful to give me something. Before I say my request, you would guess that this man is asking for something which is related to mercy. For example, he's going to ask for forgiveness. Or he's going to ask for, for example, guidance. Yeah? I cannot say, I ask Allah who is most merciful to destroy my enemies. There is no relation. There must be a relation. In the Quran, always there is a connection between our request and those qualities that we mentioned. For example, we say, "Rabbighfir warham wa anta khayrul rahimin." There is a connection between Allah being Arham al Rahimin. And my question, my request for forgiveness and mercy. Or we say, for example, in Sajdah, Urzuqni warzuq ayali min fadlik, innaka dhul fadlil azim. There is connection. I cannot say, Urzuqni warzuq ayali min fadlik, innaka dhul intaqam azim. You are great in revenge. There is no connection. Okay? So, أسأل الله الذي أكرمني بمعرفتكم ومعرفة أوليائكم ورزقني البراءة من أعدائكم أن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة. Now you have to find the connection. You ask to be with them in dunya and the hereafter. Okay? So what is the connection between this request? And that he has honored you by knowing them and their followers. What is the connection? It's very clear. The only way to be with the Ahlul Bayt in this world and the hereafter is if you are, first of all, familiar with them and their followers, and second, connected with them. There is no other way. Because to be with them in dunya doesn't mean to go and live, for example, in Medina. Live in Mashhad. This is not the meaning of being with Ahlul Bayt. Have you got any hadith that Imam Sadiq told the Shia, you must all come and live with me in Medina? You don't have such a hadith. Imam Ali says, all Shia of the world come to Kufa. We don't have such a hadith. And it doesn't make sense. Or for example, in the age of occultation, all the Shia should go to holy cities. No, we don't have such a thing. So what does it mean to be with them in dunya? And yaj'alani ma'akum fi dunya. What does it mean? Any idea? Pardon? So, what does it mean? And don't forget, ma'rifatikum wa ma'rifat awliya'ikum wa razaqan al-bara'ata min a'da'ikum. So, it cannot mean to be alone and disconnected from the community and just praying and fasting and, for example, doing something for Ahlul Bayt. To be with them in dunya means to belong to their community, to be in their camp. When you belong to a camp, 
when you belong to an organization, to an army, whatever, it's not important whether the head is present where you are or is another part of the world. It's not a matter of physical connection. Maybe you are the only one who is connected to this organization and you represent them in another part of the world. But still you belong to them. So it's a matter of belonging and membership to the same community, to the same camp, to the same party. So Velaya is membership of the same community. Velaya is not to love. Velaya is not to be friend. It's more. You know, for example, when Imam Ali alayhi salam was introduced by the Prophet on the day of Qadir as Mawla, okay? Man kuntu Mawla, fahadha aliyum Mawla. Then, what did the Prophet say afterwards? He said, Allahumma wale man wala, wa'ade man ada. O Allah, whoever has velaya of Ali, you be his wali. Wali of that person. So what does it mean? The Prophet didn't say, Allahumma ahibba man ahabba. Love whoever loves Ali. No, he didn't say this. He didn't say, O oh Allah, be sadiq and friend of who is friend of Ali. He didn't say this. He said, whoever has velaya of Ali, you be his wali. What does it mean? It means that whoever is going to belong to the community which is headed by Ali, you would be his support. Because among human beings, the prophet or his successor is the head of the community. But in reality, who is the head of this community? Allah himself. Who is the real wali? Allah. But this velaya is delegated, delegated to the Prophet and then to the Ahlul Bayt. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِمُ So, velaya means to belong to the party, to the camp, to the community which is headed by Imam alayhi salam. So, if you belong to this, don't worry. If you are, for example, alone, you live in a place that there is only you or your family. Don't worry. If you are belonging to the same group, the same community, don't worry. You know the story of Owais Karan. Owais was living in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But in Yemen. And he loved the Prophet very much. But he couldn't visit the Prophet because he had to look after his mother. See? To look after your mother is even more important than visiting the Prophet. Not than ziyara. Sometimes people, you know, go for ziyara and they leave their mother without care. That was not the ziyara of the tomb. That was the ziyara of the Prophet himself. Still, he didn't go because his mother was alone and was needing always. Finally, his mother said, okay. You can go and visit the Prophet, but don't remain in Medina. Just see him and come back. So always went to Medina. But when he went to Medina, the Prophet was not in Medina. And because he had to go back, he didn't wait. So he went all the way from Yemen to Medina and then returned. In our 
estimation, we would say he was unsuccessful. He was not lucky. He was not fortunate. Why? Because he didn't achieve what he wanted. But in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was very successful. Because he faced a test. And this test was a test which was very difficult. Because he had to choose between visiting the Prophet and listening to his mother. This test is more difficult than between choosing money and, for example, the Prophet. Because you say, okay, I don't want money. I choose the Prophet. Or between choosing your mother and money. Yeah? This is not difficult. But choosing between two good things. This is very difficult. So when the Prophet returned to Medina, said, I smell the fragrance of heaven from Yemen. So this is what always achieved. So he never saw Prophet. But this didn't reduce the position of always. Indeed, maybe he was much better than many people of Medina. You know, in Medina there were people who lived with the Prophet, who saw the Prophet every day, but they betrayed the Prophet. The Quran is clear that there were munafiqun in Medina. Inna min ahl al-Madina, some of the people of Medina, maradu ala nifaq They were munafiq, they were even making plots against the Prophet. So physical meeting is not important. What is important is belonging to the same camp that is headed by the Prophet. So, when, for example, Imam Ali alayhi salam wanted to send Malik Ashtar to Egypt, you know, Malik was very close to Imam Ali. But Imam felt that Malik is the most capable person for going there after the previous one was not successful. So Malik didn't tell Imam Ali, I want to be with you, please don't send me for any mission. I want to be with you. No. He was happy to do whatever his Imam wanted. And if, inshallah, Imam Zaman comes, he may tell you, I want you to be in a village in Africa. What would you say? Say, no, oh Imam, I want to be with you. Wherever you travel, I want to be always with you and see you. Maybe you say this sincerely. I'm not saying just to, you know, escape from going to Africa. But maybe sincerely. But this is not what Imam wants from you. The same is today. Today, we have lots of responsibilities. But some people neglect all responsibilities. And they just say, we want to see Imam as Zaman. We want to do this. We want to do that. So that we can see Imam Zaman. But this is not the point. Which one is more important? To please Imam Zaman or to see Imam Zaman? It's more important to please Imam Zaman. If you please Imam Zaman and the time comes, then he would certainly himself come and see you. Sometimes when we go to Hajj, you know, many people, of course, go to Hajj with the hope of seeing Imam Zaman. But I always say to the people who are in our group that I don't pray like this. Because I believe that I am not significant to say to Imam Zaman, you know, please let me see you. Imam has lots of important things to do. And then put this pressure on Imam that, you know, leave all your responsibilities and come so that I can see you. Who am I to ask this? If he feels that there is a need for this and this is useful, of course, I will be more than happy. But I don't make this, you know, even as a request. Because we know that 
What is important in the end of day is to work for him. If you are a soldier in an army, what should be your priority? To see every day the commander or to listen to his commands? If you listen to his commands, it's more important than seeing him. Maybe in all your life you would not see the commander. It's not important. You must serve him. And then, if you serve him in dunya, in akhirah you will be with him. This is important. Just to see Imam Zaman in dunya doesn't necessarily mean that everything will be all right. There are people who see Imam Zaman and later they become corrupt. Why? Because then they become proud of themselves. They think that, oh, I was such a good person that among millions of people, Imam chose me. So I must be different. And then they become proud of themselves. Or then they gradually try to attract people to themselves. So to be able to see them in dunya is not necessarily a sign of progress. But to be with them in akhirah is important. Can I be with them in akhirah? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that on the day of resurrection people come to the plane of resurrection individually. This is the Quran. Kullun Everyone would come as an individual. You cannot say, we take a bus and go together. No, you have to go alone. Every person goes alone. Carrying the weight of his actions. Okay? But, when all people are there, a call comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, for example, in the school, early morning, children playing, you know, everywhere. But, then they ring the bell, for example, and then every group must stand in his own queue. Different, for example, class year one, year two, year three, they will be put in different groups. So the same will happen on the day of judgment. All come as individuals. Then a call comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ Allah doesn't say year one, year two, year three. Allah says the community of Ibrahim, the community of Musa, the community of Jesus, the community of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The community of Fir'aun, the community of Nimrud, the community of Abu Sufyan, and everyone quickly would join his own community and stand behind his own leader. If you want more, read Al-Mizan or Tafsir Namune about this verse. يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ This is the verse 71 of Surah Isra, Bani Israel. Number 71. Every person on the day of judgment would know where to join. You don't need to ask which is my group, which is my community. 
Because on the day of judgment, the realities become obvious. يَوْمَ تُبْلَ sarair. Every hidden thing is clear. And there is no benefit in claim. Allegations. No. I cannot say, I was a good Muslim. Look at my name. Such a beautiful name I have. I have beard, I have Abba, Imam, everything. No. They say, no, we don't accept these things. We want to see your reality. How can they understand my reality? There are many ways. I have records of my amal, either in my right hand or left hand. So just the fact that you have your record in right hand or left hand is enough to show what type of person you are. They don't need to open and read. Okay? Just by looking at who is carrying his record on the right or left, they understand. But even without that, it is clear. Because if you look at face of people, you would understand this person was a good person or bad. يُعْرَفُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ بِسِيمَاهُمْ Just by looking at their face, you would realize. Why? Because some faces are very bright, happy, shining, and some are dusted and dark. وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ مُسْفِرَةٌ ضَاحِكَةٌ مُسْتَبْشِرَةٌ There are some faces which are very like open. They are smiling. They are very happy, joyful. وَوَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَلَيْهَا غَبَرَةٌ تَرَحَقُهَا قَتَرَةٌ And there are faces which are dusted and sad. وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَى رَبَّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ There are faces which are very happy and they look at the Lord. And there are people who are very shameful and they always bring their head down. There is also light. This is very beautiful in Surah Tahrim and Surah Hadid. Allah talks about the difference between believers, mu'mineen, and hypocrites, munafiqeen. On the day of judgment, please later reflect on these verses, Surah Tahrim and Surah Hadid. Allah says, the mu'minin when they come, they have lots of light. Of course, this light is there in dunya, but we may not be able to see. It's only when someone has lots of light, we may feel that this person is, you know, with light. But otherwise, normally we don't see. But on the day of judgment, it's very clear. Allah says, يَوْمَ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا انظُرُونَ نَقْتَبِسْ مِنْ نُورِكُمْ Men and women who were munafiq, they would tell mu'mineen, please look at us. So we take from your light. Because they are in darkness. They see mu'mineen are full of light. To the extent that the Qur'an says, نورهم يسعى بين أيديهم وبأيمانهم Their light goes fast in front of them and on their right side. So when a mu'min is looking in this way, all the way is projected with light. And also right side. Okay? So these people say, please turn your face to us so that we get some light. نَقْتَبِسْ مِنْ نُورَكُمْ We take from your light. But, unfortunately, this is not working. Light is something that you cannot borrow. Or you cannot steal. Therefore, قِيلَ ارْجَعُوا وَرَاءَكُمْ فَالْتَمِسُوا نُورَ They will be told, return backwards. Go to your own past 
and seek light. Fazoreba bainahum besur, then a wall will be erected between them and mu'mineen. And this goes on and on. It's very beautiful because I want to continue my topic. So please later reflect on these verses in Surah Hadid and Surah Tahrim. So people on the Day of Judgment automatically would know and others also would know to which group they belong. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said Ala tahmidun Allah إذا كان يوم القيامة فدعا كل قوم إلى من يتبلونه ودعانا إلى رسول الله وفزعتم إلينا Imam said when the day of judgment comes don't you praise that when the day of judgment comes Allah would ask everyone to follow his own leader we would follow the prophet and you would come to us, you would join us. Then Imam said, فَإِلَىٰ أَيْنَ تَرَوْنَا يُذْحَبُ بِكُمْ Then do you see where you will be taken? When you join us and we join the Prophet. So when will he take you? إِلَىٰ الْجَنَّةِ وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ Imam three times said, By the Lord of Kaaba." you will be taken to heaven. So we have only one difficult thing. And that is to make sure that on the day of judgment we can prove that we belong to their community. This is what we need to achieve. To prove that you belong to them the rest will be sorted out by them. Because every leader would take his people to where he himself is going. Pharaoh would take his people to hell. He would take them to hell. But if you follow divine leaders, then they would take you to heaven. So, أَنْ يَجْعَلَنِي مَعَكُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَأَنْ يُثَبِّتَ لِعِنَّكُمْ قَدَمَ صِدْقٍ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ If you want to have firm and honest standpoint with them in dunya and akhira, what is the way? How can you be firm? How can you avoid going astray or being... Shaken in your faith or being deviated, how can you avoid that? This is a challenge, especially in Akhirul Zaman. You know, in Akhirul Zaman, there are people who are very good and then they change. Even some hadith suggest that this can happen in a matter of few hours. يُصْبِحُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا In the morning, you are mu'min. By the time you go back home, you are kafir. Or يُمْسِي مُؤْمِنًا وَيُصْبِحُ كَافِرًا In the beginning of night, he or she was a mu'min. Then, during the night, iman is lost. So it's very difficult. So how can we have qadam as As an honest standpoint which is firm. Don't forget the key. بِمَعْرِفَتِكُمْ وَمَعْرِفَةِ أَوْلِيَائِكُمْ وَرَزَقَنِ الْبَرَاءَةَ مِنْ عَدَائِكُمْ If you know your leaders, if you know your companions, the members of the community, and make sure that you remain within the community, you will be saved. Otherwise, you will become a prey for the wolves. 
So the only way to survive is to remain within the community. And there are many other things in Ziyarat Ashura, but because time is short, I go to other Ziyarat and Du'as. In Du'a Ahd, do you know who prescribed Du'a Ahd? Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. So, several generations before Imam Mahdi, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam told the Shia that in the time of Qaybah, you should recite this dua, and if you recite 40 days, then inshallah you would be able to serve Imam. Even if he die, you die before he comes, you will be resurrected, and you can join Imam. And I think that this doesn't mean that you say it for 40 days and that's it. Then you say, okay, I have done it for 40 days. I think Imam Sadiq wants you to get used to it. So if you de- say 40 days, then you would not be able to stop it. It becomes a habit, good habit for you. In this dua, when you want to send salutation to Imam, how do you send your salutation? Allahumma ballagh mawlana al-imam al-hadi al-mahdi. And then you mention the name of Imam. And then you say, An jami'i al-mu'mineen wal-mu'minat. Early morning, maybe you are sleepy. Maybe you want to go to bed again soon. But Imam Sadiq says, first, before you send salutation on your own behalf, you, ha- you have to send salutation on behalf of all mu'mineen. Jami'i al-mu'mineen wal-mu'minat. What does it mean? It means that you have to start your day with the remembrance of Imam and the community of Imam. Okay? It's the beginning of your day. Jami al mu'minin wal mu'minat includes every single mu'min. But for maximum emphasis, you have to say, fi mashariq al ardi wa magharibha. In the east and west. Now you tell me, how many Shia lived in the east in the time of Imam Sadiq? You know, China was known at that time. But did we have any Shia in China? Or in the West? Even the West, which was known at that time, like Europe and North Africa, we didn't have Shia at that time. Don't you think Imam Sadiq was thinking about our situation? He had the situation of the community at this time, that you see the community is spread all over the world, and you as a Shia are supposed to remember every member of this community, and feel connected to them, and give priority to them. So you say, and جَمِيعِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ فِي مَشَارِقِ الْأَرْضِ وَمَغَارِبِهَا and again, for extra emphasis, barraha wa bahraha. Whether they are in land or in sea, in ocean. Maybe there is a Shia community, a Shia family in an island in the Pacific Ocean. You have to remember them. Maybe there is a sailor or there is a, I don't know, fisherman. You have to remember him. You have to feel connected. So how is it possible that there are people who live in the same town and they don't know about each other? They don't meet each other. Imam Sadr says, even the people that you may not see them in all your life, you have to remember them. You have to pray for them. You have to send salutation on their behalf to Imam. So why we are so much far from what our imams wanted? 
And then sahlaha wa jabalaha. Maybe someone is in a plain, on a plain, in a desert. Maybe someone is in a mountain. It makes no difference. And then you say, wa'anni wa'anwa ledayya. After you mention all the believers, then you say, on my own behalf, on behalf of my parents also. In Dua'i Nudbah, there are some beautiful sentences which relate to our discussion. You know that the Dua'i Nudbah has different stages. And maybe we can say the peak of Dua is when you start talking to Imam Zaman. And you address Imam directly. In that peak, you say, "Hal min mu'inin fa'utila ma'ahu al-abila wal buka." Is any helper with whom I can prolong my crying for you? You may think that crying for Imam Zaman is something personal. I want to cry for Imam Zaman in my house. Okay, but you must know that according to Ahlul Bayt, you have also to cry together. And you have to look for helpers. It means that even crying, which is something very personal and spiritual, must be done as a community. And you know what happens if you cry together? Otila, then you can cry longer. This is the beauty. If I cry for five minutes, you can cry for five minutes. But when we cry, to, uh, cry together, what is the result? Five plus five? No. It will be five in five. So it will not be 10. It will be much more than 10. This is the blessing of working together. If one mosque works for Ahlul Bayt, does lots of you know, good things for Ahlul Bayt and tabligh and everything. Another mosque also does lots of good things for Ahlul Bayt. But if they are joint, the result is not adding this to that. The result is multiplied. Unfortunately, we see that, first of all, in many cases, our people, not only they don't work together, they work against each other. And if they don't work against each other, at least they work without each other. And this is not good, this is not wise. We have to sit together, to plan together, and then our amal, our actions will be blessed. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. With few companions, for many years he had only few people, but. These people were very united. He changed the world. Imam Ali alayhi salam with tens of thousands of people who were divided even couldn't protect his own caliphate. It's not because Imam Ali was not capable. If you have the best leaders but there is no united community behind them, what can you do? Imam Ali said, لا رأي لمن لا يطاع. The one who is not obeyed has no view. His view is not important. His view is not significant. If we are, instead of 150 million Shia, for example, in the world, if we were just one million, but all united, We could change the whole world to better world. 
But 150 million Shia who are disunited, they cannot do anything. They cannot even protect themselves. هَلْ مِنْ مُعِينٍ فَأُطِيلَ مَعَهُ الْعَبِيلَ وَالْبُكَاءِ هَلْ مِنْ جَزُوعٍ فَأُصَاعِدَ جَزَعْهُ إِذَا خَلَى Is anyone lamenting for you that I help him when he is alone, when he is in private? Look, our imams want us not only to meet in the mosque or in the Husayniyyah, which is, of course, necessary. But our imams want to be connected to each other even as a khala. You have to have such an intimate relationship. And then, هَلْ قَذِيَةَ عَيْنٌ فَسَاعَدَتْهَا عَيْنِي عَلَى الْقَذَى You know, in Arabic, qadha means when something goes to the eye, you know, a thatch or something goes to your eye, then your eye becomes red and painful. So this is the situation. As Imam Ali said, Sabartu wa fil ayn qadha wa fil halq shaja. So, here we say to Imam Zaman, is any eye in pain for you so that my eye helps that eye by taking part of the pain. This is the amount of unity that must be there. And then you see, in the first sentence you say, Hal min mu'in. You ask for a helper. But in the second and third, you ask for someone to help. Sa'adat ha'ayni. Osa'id. In a good community, people offer help much more easily than seeking help. In a community which is not good community, everyone is seeking for help. Please help me, please help me. But in the community that Ahlul Bayt want, everyone is more prepared to offer help. Two ways you are offering help. Usa'id, sa'adat ha'ayni. This is very important. If you see there is a problem, don't say why people are not doing anything. Say, what I can do. This is the only way forward. Because it's very, you know, easy to talk about negative points, about, you know, the failure and shortcomings, and then say, no one is doing anything. And then the situation would remain the same. A mu'min is the one who always says, what can I do for the community? What is my responsibility and if everyone thinks like this the situation would be improving but if everyone starts complaining and waiting for other people to do something nothing will happen in another part in dua in nudba we say atarana nahuffu bik wa anta ta'ummul mala do you think this would come, or when do you think this would happen? That we gather around you, nahuffobik, haffa in Arabic means to gather around something. We gather around you while you lead the masses. This is very important. You don't ask, oh Imam Zaman, when can I see you? When do you give me good money, good job, good car? No, you ask for something very important. When is the time that we can gather around you, serve you, so that you can lead the mankind? Unfortunately, some Shia, when they talk about Imam Zaman, 
they talk in the way that Imam Zaman is coming to is going to come to save the Shia and to become the leader of the Shia and this is not the case Imam Zaman is the savior for mankind Imam Zaman is the leader of humanity not the leader of Shia the Shia have to protect and help and serve Imam Nahuffu bik wa anta ta'ummul mala every human being with good will would benefit from Imam Zaman so he is the leader for mankind savior for mankind not savior of the Shia indeed at the beginning the followers of Imam have to be ready for lots of sacrifice day and night they have to work it's not that Imam Zaman comes and says okay we give you tickets and money go for holidays this is the time of zuhur go and enjoy yourself no when Imam Zaman comes perhaps he would say you have had enough rest you have enjoyed yourself so much this is the time for working together hard there is a hadith that once Imam Sadiq alayhi salam talked about the difficulties of the time of Zuhur. And one of the Shia said, if this is the case, so we don't pray for it to happen. And then Imam said, you shouldn't be selfish. The prayer for Faraj is not that you enjoy. It is so that the humanity can be saved. So, whenever we talk about Imam Zaman, we have to talk in the way that would attract the sympathy of all people, of all good people. And here, because I may forget, so I should say here, that when I talk about the community of believers and the unity of the Shia, this unity is not against anyone. This is quite wrong. We don't get united to destroy, for example, other Muslims or other religions. This unity is to serve mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummah. You are the best nation. But in what sense? In the sense that Racists say, or those who believe in, for example, discrimination say, no. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrajat linnas. You are the best nation to serve humanity. In Islam, to be best means to be best in giving service. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَٰلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُحَدَاء عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا Allah has made us a moderate and balanced nation so that we can become witness for all humanity as the Prophet is witness for us. So, we have to achieve this unity and everyone would benefit from this unity. If you want to just imagine you know, the situation, this view that I am trying to explain is a view which is based on Tawheed. According to this view, every person has to be an instrument for unity. Unity inside families. Unity inside sub-communities. Unity inside the community in each town. Then unity inside the community in every country, in every continent. 
unity of all Shia, then unity of all Muslims, then unity of all believers. Of course, it is like when you throw a stone in water, you have waves. When the circle becomes bigger, it becomes weaker. What does it mean? It means that with the people who are closest, you have more to share. So you have much more to share with your Shia brothers and sisters. But you have to let this extend, be extended to include all Muslims. And then to include all believers in God. And then all people who may not even have faith, but they are good people. You can have some unity with them on moral values, so that gradually they become attracted. But the people who have satanic idea, like Pharaoh, instead of building unity over unity, they build division over division. وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيَعَ He was dividing people. So, I wanted to make this clear that we want this unity to serve all humanity. And you know, for example, one challenge that we have today is that because we don't have the same understanding, the same idea, some people say we should get united with the... Sunni brothers and sisters, some people say we don't want unity. The same is happening in the Sunni world. Everyone is saying something. But if we were united and having one word, then we would be in a better position to have unity with others and to defend our common good. In any case, in Dua Nudba, there are many ideas. I gave you just some examples. I gave you some examples from Ziyarat Ashura, from Dua'ya Ahd, from Ziyarat Aminullah, from Dua'ya Iftita, from Ziyarat Jami'ah. I have re references to give you. But I am worried that I may make you very tired and also I want to listen to your questions and comments. So, maybe what I said so far is hopefully clear and I don't think it's difficult to understand just the challenge is how to implement this Islam is a religion which wants to form a community Islam is not a religion which wants to trans transform only individuals this is obvious everywhere but unfortunately we don't get the message in your Salat in your Hajj, in fasting, in giving alms, everything has social aspect. Why so much emphasis on saying Salat in Jama'ah? Why? And you know, if you say Salat with one person, reward is much more than saying Salat individually. Three people, four people, five people, then when it reaches ten, the reward is so high that we cannot measure. Why, according to the school of Ahlul Bayt, all the Shia in one town must come together for Jum'ah, unless the town is very big and there is certain distance. This is not in the Sunni Islam. In the Sunni Islam, in every mosque they have Jum'ah. But in the school of Ahlul Bayt, all the mosques, once a week at least, have to come together and have one Imam of Jum'ah. Why? Why, if someone doesn't attend Jum'ah for three successive Jum'ah, is a munafiq? Of course, some people say this is for the time of Huzur of Imams. But hadith says, مَنْ تَرَكَ الْجُمْعَ سَلَاسًا مُتَتَابِعًا بِغَيْرِ عُذْرٍ كُتِبَ مُنَافِقًا Why you have to come to the community? Why in Shia Islam, when you are in Jama'ah, you have to be connected? You know, our Sunni brothers, if you go to Hajj, you see, 
Sometimes a shopkeeper comes out of the shop and then makes the knee of Jama'ah maybe kilometers away from Masjid al-Haram. But we say you have to be connected. Why? Because when you are physically connected, then hatred goes away. You know, we shake hand, brothers, you know, shake hand with each other, sisters shake hand with each other. This has great barakah. Because when you shake hand, then this removes hatred. And there is a beautiful hadith that says, when two people shake hand with each other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would shake hand with the one who has greater love for the other one. So if I shake hand with my brother and I love him more than he loves me, then I am shaking hand with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, physical connection is very important in the jama'ah. Then, you have to wait till imam starts. Why? This is a lesson for leadership and building community. Wait for your leader. Don't precede him and also don't remain behind. Just follow him. And then Imam should adjust his speed according to Az'aful Ma'mumin. So if I am leading the Jama'ah, there are some old people in my congregation who have back pain or arthritis, you know, they cannot stand, or when I go for ruku, they cannot, you know, remain in ruku. So I have to consider them. What does it mean? It means that the leader must know exactly the situation of his community. How much they are ready what problems they have. If I am imam for 500 people, I must know all these 500 people. Otherwise, how can I adjust my speed according to Az'aful Ma'mumin? So it means that I must know everyone in my community. You say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ even if your salat is furada, why you say we? Why you don't say iyaka a'bud? I only worship you. You say we. Iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Why always we? Up to the end. Assalamu alayna. Not assalamu alayya. Why? Isn't this because Islam wants to teach us that you have to always speak as a member of the community. Think about the whole community. Want everything good for the whole community. Don't be selfish. Don't just think about yourself or maximum about your family. About everyone. And then about Hajj about everything in Islam. So, I stop here, and I am very thankful for your patience. You have been very good audience. May Allah reward you. May Allah, inshallah, increase your light and your, inshallah, love for him and for the Ahlul Bayt. If, I don't know, we, we have questions now, or we Okay, so we say just to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are very thankful to you for this gift of being able to gather together here. And I pray that inshallah the community here and then the community worldwide inshallah would be able to move towards implementation of this idea of community. May Allah inshallah bring our hearts and minds even closer 
and may inshallah Allah make our Imam Zaman happy and pleased with us. Thank you again.